<laughs> but he's wise enough to move here. Uh, and um, before he became a full-time writer, he was a book and magazine editor. Um, he's had articles that have appeared in numerous publications, right. just to name a few, the New York Times, the Herald Tribune, Commentary, Boston Magazine. Um, he's authored seven books on the subject uh, of education. Ten books. Ten books. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You're reading an old book. An old one. <laughs> Subject of education mostly, and he has interest in uh, and literacy. And literacy and homeschooling, right? Yes. Yeah. yes, yes. Um, but tonight he's here as a Shakespearean. Right, right. Talk about his book, The Marlowe Shakespeare Connection, right up there. Um, and we welcome Dr. Bloomfield. Thank, well, thank you. you. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming to this lecture. Uh, of course, you must know why there is this authorship question. And it's simply because all of the biographical information that we have about William Shakespeare simply does not match the works that were written under his name. You're dealing with the greatest literary genius in all of human history. You're not dealing with an average writer. Uh, the works attributed to Shakespeare represent the highest, the epitome of literary uh, attainment. And uh, as such, you want to know something about such a person. Uh, if, if this man was the greatest literary genius in all of history, what was he like? Where was he born? Where was he educated? Well, we know that Shakespeare had no education at all as far as documentation. But the question has always been, and, and of course there are a lot of people who have, uh, who have accepted the notion that Shakespeare didn't write the plays and that somebody else did, People like Henry James, Sigmund Freud, Mark Twain, and many other, the Orson Welles. The, the question always became, if he didn't write the plays, if William Shakespeare didn't write the plays, who did? Well, there have been several contenders. Uh, the three main contenders have been uh, Sir Francis Bacon, the great statesman, scientist, uh, writer who lived during that period of time. But uh, it seems unlikely that Francis Bacon, if he had written the 36 plays in the first folio, it's unlikely that he would not have disclaimed authorship. He had an ego the size of a house. <laughs> So if he had written the greatest plays in human history, he would have taken full credit. And he was alive when the uh, first folio was being published in 1623. The second contender uh, that uh, has gotten a lot of promotion and publicity is the uh, 17th Earl of Oxford, Edward de Vere. And the people who adhere to the Ox to that theory are called Oxfordians. And the reason why Oxford is a very, uh, you might say, unlikely writer of the plays is because he died too soon. He died before several of the very important plays were written. And another thing is that um, he was not a great literary genius. The only, the only uh, writings that we have of him are a few poems, a few poems written in his youth, and that's about it. And they don't show genius. So he certainly was not the greatest literary genius in all of human history. He was basically a dilettante. Uh, he uh, helped other writers, uh, and so he's a very unlikely uh, Contender. The third contender, of course, is Christopher Marlowe. Now, 
Why do I believe that it was Christopher Marlowe who actually wrote the plays? Well, let me start at the beginning of how I got involved in this. Back in 1960s, when I was an editor at Grosset and Dunlap in New York City, I'm sure you've all heard of Grosset and Dunlap. They published all those wonderful series books, you know, um, uh, Nancy Drew and, uh, and that sort of thing. <coughs> and incidentally, when I was there, I analyzed why those books sold so well. And it was because the kids are always smarter than the adults. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, when I was, I, I was the editor of the Universal Library, which was their quality paperback line, and a man by the name of Calvin Hoffman came to me, uh, came to my office. He had just uh, written a book that was published by uh, a New York publisher. Uh, the title was the, man, the, uh, the Murder of the Man Who Was Shakespeare. And it was his contention that Christopher Marlowe was the actual writer of the plays. And, what, and because he had read Marlowe and he had read Shakespeare, and he saw that they seemed to be written by the same person. There was a, a continuum between Marlowe's works as we know them and, and the works in the, uh, in the first folio. But, you have, but there was this problem. Mahler was supposed to have been killed at the age of 29 in a so-called barroom brawl. And what uh, Hoffman found out was that he was not actually killed, that this was a faked death. It was faked to get him out of trouble because he was being indicted by the Archbishop's Inquisition for the crime of atheism, blasphemy, and all kinds of things. That and as you know, as a great genius, they usually say all kinds of things, don't they? I mean, he wasn't an ordinary human being. And also because he, he had this genius, he was sometimes very outspoken, dangerously outspoken. But in any case, uh, I, I read his book, and I became a Marlovian. <laughs> I thought, my, this is... This is the only explanation we have. And of course, I had known nothing about the Shakespeare authorship question before that. But after reading uh, Calvin Hoffman's book, uh, I decided that, uh, yes, Marlowe was it, and that this was a faked, um, a faked death. And all you have to read is the actual coroner's inquest to see how phony that whole inquest was. That it just is a, it's a scenario, that's all. It's a scenario to get uh, Marlow off the hook, and also the person who was supposed to have murdered him was done in self-defense. He went to jail for a very short time and was pardoned by the queen, you see. So Queen Elizabeth was involved in this whole plot. <laughs> you see, Marlow was also a member of the Secret Service. He was a spy. He was an intelligence agent, and his boss, Lord Burley, who was Queen Elizabeth's right-hand man, decided that Marlow was too important, too valuable, to risk his being hanged by the Inquisition. And so it was Burley, as well as other individuals involved, who planned this fake death after which Mahler went into exile. Now the interesting thing about his exile is that he probably went to Italy. Because as you know, all of a sudden we get all these plays, you know, that are based in Italy. You have Romeo and Juliet, Two uh, Gentlemen of Verona, uh, The Taming of the Shrew, all Italian plays. And uh, I, I guess that's, that's why he wrote that he was there and uh, had absorbed that whole Italian scene. And also he had access to many Italian books. And Mahler was a great, uh, how would you say, <coughs> acquirer of other people's stories. You see, that's the, one of the reasons why he was 
able to write so many plays is because he had a basic plot, but he could turn it into a masterpiece. He could take a, an Italian story and turn it into a masterpiece because of uh, that's this mind that he had, this incredible mind. And um, so that's, that's how I got involved in, in the model theory. And then I decided at the age of 72, or, or to write my own book on it because Calvin Hoffman died in the 1980s and uh, I thought that I could improve on his version uh, because uh, he really didn't have as much access to uh, materials that are now available. So I started writing my book and it took seven years to complete it. Now in all that time, had I come across a single fact that would have said couldn't possibly be true, Mollick couldn't be the writer, I would have stopped work. I would have decided to spend my time on other things, maybe writing mystery stories or you know, <laughs> romances or whatever. <laughs> but I was determined to finish the book. And uh, I had a very hard time getting it published. Today's publishers, you know, when I was in the publishing business back in the 60s, they were real people who knew literature, you know. But they're all gone now. The people who now run the big publishing companies are all young individuals who don't have our tastes, you know, don't have our judgment about literature. And uh, so I, uh, you know, I submitted it all over the place and did not find a publisher. Uh, the University of Virginia Press hold on, held on to the manuscript, which was over a thousand pages, for a year, and they decided not to publish it. And then finally I did find a publisher in North Carolina, McFarland. Um, that publisher specializes in scholarly books for libraries and colleges and that sort of thing. So that's how I, got, uh, that's how I was able to get it published. But in any case, the, the wonderful thing about this adventure, and incidentally I noticed that most of the people here are sort of my age, you know. <laughs> and, and so, it was something for me to start writing this in my 70s, you know, and to take seven years to complete it, which just proves that age is not a hindrance to writing masterpieces, <laughs> which is what I hope I did. But I'll tell you the one thing the one thing that convinced me that Marla was the, was the writer was this simple uh, timeline. Both Marlowe and Shakespeare were born in 1564. And for the first 29 years, 29, this is when Marlowe was supposed to have been killed. Marlowe wrote all of those plays that were on that sheet that I gave you. Very productive. He knew a lot of people. He had a marvelous, he had the best education that anyone could have in the Elizabethan age. He went to the King's School, uh, preparatory school, and then Cambridge University where he, he spent six years. You know, he spent six years at uh, Cambridge University. So he had the very finest education. And also he, he was a,